morning everyone. Um, so it's great to see so many people here today. Um, as I think most of you know, the informatics group has been working on um, problems associated with computer vision and uh, digitization for the last year or so. Um, and we've been using it to develop new digitization workflows that can really make our digitization much quicker. Um, and through the synthesis project, we've had um, some funding to uh, work on this and kind of do more with uh, image analysis and start looking at the extraction of traits and other kind of automated metadata processing. Um, and this synthesis work also uh, includes the funding that has allowed us to have James here for the past four weeks um, to undertake this exploratory analysis of some of our specimen images. So James has just finished um, his second year studying computer science at UCL and um, he did a really cool project which kind of uh, uh, we saw which was um, a functional web-based system for automatically tagging the British Library's um, images from a lot of their books and that was stuff like automatically working out whether they were music sheets, whether there were people in the image and so James has been applying some of that work to our specimen images. Um, we've been really impressed with your work over the past uh, couple of weeks, it's been really cool so um, I hope you enjoy um, his talk. Over to you. Thanks. Okay, so the main aim of this was to kind of come up with some prototypes and do some experimental work just to see what's really possible starting to apply computer vision because it hasn't really been done that much before. And so we wanted to just use open source libraries and explore a range of problems and just see what can be done and how they compare to human measurements. So the tools that I used, um, I used Python which is the programming language you know, just free to use, download, and two main libraries. So there's something called OpenCV, which is a computer vision library, and something called Scikit Imaging, Scikit Image for doing the image processing. So these are open source. They're free to download. They're being constantly maintained by people, and they're pretty close to the state of the art. So the first thing, um, well, the main data that we're using were these butterfly images. And the first thing was just to get the specimen away from the rest of the image. So these have, there's a ruler, there's labels, and there's other things there. And it seems obvious what the butterfly is, but to a computer it's not. So the first thing was to come up with what's called a saliency map, which is basically a map of what's relevant or interesting in the image. And that can be different for different purposes, but for this, it's basically how colorful and how bright uh, the pixels are. So you can see here, it tends to pick out the butterfly, but it also picks out the label as well. So then I thresholded that to see which ones were the highest and lowest and just cut off. So again, it's still got the butterfly in the label. And then the final step was to find the connected regions. So all the kind of biggest blobs of, of white pixels. And then almost invariably the butterfly is the biggest one and then we can just extract down to that. So that gives a, a much tighter image, but for the purposes of the computer vision, it's helpful to have just a single component with no holes and no noise and kind of <coughs> false positives. So, so there was a final refinement step to get down to a cleaner, cleaner image. And that was done by basically shrinking the mask down to get an area where we're very certain that that's the foreground, that's what we're interested in. And then growing it out, which is the black region, where you're very certain that that's going to be background. But there's a lot of unknowns in between. And so we just used what's called a graph cut algorithm. This is all built into OpenCV. It's available to use. And that just finds a lowest cost cut, a lowest cost cut that goes through this white region and separates the foreground from the background. And the result of that is a very nice, clean mask that's all connected. There are some errors, but for what we're doing, it wasn't really an issue because it's just around the head, which is a very difficult region to do anyway, because it's very similar to the background. So that segmentation really forms the basis of a lot of the metadata extraction, because that's when you really have the actual specimen that you're looking at. So the first problem that we studied was trying to detect these glands for this butterfly sp uh, species. They only exist in the male specimen, not the females. But this is a process that can be applied to many different things, not just insect analysis, because this is really just an object detection task. So if, whether the gland is there or not. And so to do this, it was a combination of image processing and machine learning. So it's not specific to what we're doing, 
we're just putting in the data that is specific. So the way to do that is to have positive and negative examples. The positive ones were all extracted manually. So there's about 150 images. I just found where this gland is and cropped it down to a square. That's easy. And the negative ones are just randomly cropped out from female images. You can see that they're not specifically from any part. It could be from anywhere. It's just any example of an image that is not of this gland. Then there was analysis on these images. Using something called a Gabor filter, these are filters that have been um, made using a Gabor function, and these functions were designed to try and replicate how humans see or how mammals see, because they can roughly approximate uh, certain cells of the visual cortex, and so they should be quite good at finding things that humans can see. And so on the left, this is what's called a filter bank. It's just a range of different filters at different sizes and orientations. It probably doesn't mean a lot to look at, but you can basically see that they're all going to be doing different things when you filter an image through these filters. And on the right is the response when you filter this image up here with all the different filters. So brighter areas, it's got a higher response. Dark areas, it's got a lower response. Again, it's quite hard to see what's going on, but the main thing to pick out is that these ones near the bottom right where you have that similar orientation to what you've got in the image are giving a higher response. The point of, do, of doing this is that it's quite hard to describe an image just by its pixels alone because there's lots of data, there's lots of noise and there really isn't much structure whereas by putting it through these filters it's down to 32 values which are actually meaningful. So anything that has the same response to these filters probably is the same thing. And so from this we get a feature vector, which is basically just a description. And when you've got the description for all these images, you want a way to separate them. So some of them describe something where this gland is, whatever object you have, and some of them describe where it's not, anything where it isn't. So say for example in this 2D example, your, the glands might be these filled in circles, and something that isn't a gland has the same response as these empty ones. And so the idea is to try and find a line that will go straight between them, such that if you had a new example and just put it in your space, you could just check which side of the line it's on, and that'll tell you is this is a gland or this is not a gland. Um, this example is in 2D. We're actually in 32-dimensional space, but the principle is exactly the same. Uh, and this is something called a support vector machine. Again, this is all just in the libraries that can be used. And these are some of the results. So all the training examples came from 150 images, and then we ran that on the full set of 721. For the male specimens, it correctly found, again, 96% of the time. And for the females, 72% of the time. So it's quite a bit less. And this basically kind of indicated that more often than not, it would find it if it was there, but it tends to misclassify things as well. Um, so you can see the top two, it did quite well, even though they're fairly different. These two at the bottom were a bit stranger. This, this is a male specimen, it did find it, but <coughs> it didn't think it was the highest probability. Going from green to red, that's uh, good to bad matches. So I tend to find these edges of the wings as well, um, because for the sake of these filters, they do look the same. So this is something that can be improved upon. Um, but it was a bit out of the scope of this project, unfortunately. Uh, but for a female specimen, again, this could be a problem with the data because it's found what it thinks is a match, but it's in a very similar place to where it should be on the male wing. So it's possible that in cropping out all the samples, the positive samples, I've really just been detecting that part of the wing because it's, it's finding that top edge and everything else looks kind of similar. Um, so again, this can be improved upon and this isn't even something that would need computer vision expertise. If you're more careful with the data you put in, you should get better results out. So again, using the segmentation, we can do more uh, metadata extraction. This was for finding physical measurements for the butterflies, so the wing length and area. Um, so the first step was just to separate the wings away from the body, uh, which again probably seems like it's quite obvious but 
it's not, <laughs> it wasn't really. Um, so the, the idea I came up with was to basically, if you imagine trying to take a path from the top of the image and find a shortest path or a path of least resistance down to the bottom of the image, uh, right underneath the abdomen. Uh, one of these on the left for the left wing, one on the right for the right wing. Uh, and basically constrain that down to try and find. So anything kind of going through the black space, that's just the distance of the path. Whereas going through white pixels has additional cost. So it wants to try and avoid crossing through the butterfly as much as possible. And that tends to just cut right through the, between the abdomen and the wing. And this gives a reasonably good result. It doesn't quite follow the shape of the abdomen because of the nature of trying to find the shortest line, which is a straight line. But for the sake of a wing area measurement, it is fairly close. And for finding the length from the body to the wing tip, it doesn't make any difference. The only problem was that we still need a scale factor to go from the pixels to an actual real world measurement. And again, we didn't really have time to implement that. But all the machinery is there, and that can just be built on top to get the actual measurements out. What we did do, though, was for about 20 specimen images, computed the scale factor by hand, and then compared it to some uh, real hand-done measurements for specimens. And with the exception of one wing on one specimen, it was generally pretty good. Uh, this just shows the difference between the automated measurement and the hand measurement for the right wing in blue and the left wing in red. And so for the majority of them, it was within about 0.4 millimeters, which was relatively good, um, considering the wings are about 40 millimeters long. And when you average between the left and right wings, this drops down to 0.21 millimeters, which I think is a reasonable uh, reasonable estimation. Uh, the final thing we did with insects was a color analysis. So this doesn't have any idea of structure or uh, shape of the wings or anything, but this is just to try and see if there's a link between, or if you can extract a link between different species, different families, just from the color coloration. And so again, using segmentation for the wings and the abdomen, the idea was to try and find what are the most dominant colors that are exhibited there. Um, and that's what these color palettes show. They're just ordered from darkest to lightest colors. And so this, um, I initially just kind of tried to cluster them in a 3D space, because every pixel is, just has a red, green, and blue value, which is a three-dimensional coordinate, and f see which ones are closest together, um, which worked OK. But then it turned out that there is a better way of doing this, which is using something called lab color, which is just a different color space. And similar to Gabor filters, this was, uh, this was made in a way to try and reflect human vision a bit more. So it's perceptually uniform, which basically means that the distance between two colors reflects how a human might see it. Whereas in RGB space, um, humans are a lot more receptive to green than they are to red or blue. So that distance doesn't quite match up to what you might see as a human, uh, or as a butterfly, maybe. Um, so yeah, so you, then using the lab space, managed to cluster into these uh, palettes. As you can see, for the same family, they look relatively similar, and you can pick out the difference between the, uh, the third one and the different one. Using this, um, not using the full palette, but just a mean value or an average value for the hue and average value for the saturation, so basically the, the shade and how colorful it is, um, or type of color. Um, you can cluster some examples from different species to see if they do really match up, if this is a good way of separating them. As you can see here, there is quite a bit of overlap, but they, um, they do form into bands basically and clusters, and so at the very least you can have a an improved understanding of what a species might be just from its colors um, and narrow it down a bit more. The final thing was looking at these herbarium sheets to try and see which, uh, which parts of this uh, specimen might be most interesting to look at or to extract. So in this case it was trying to find areas of higher chlorophyll concentration which should really be the the greenest, 
greenest areas. Um, these were the first, first attempts. Uh, in these images, the brightest bits should be the greener ones, a uh, higher chlorophyll. As you can see, it didn't really work very well at all. Uh, and this one, it couldn't even find the specimen as being higher chlorophyll than the, the background. Um, so this is just intuition, RGB, the green channel, higher green, should be more chlor chlorophyll. But it didn't really work. But then found some research on the subject that had compared uh, actual chlorophyll measurements against a range of different uh, metrics and the one with the highest correlation was actually a combination of the red and green channels but inverted so uh, less green and less red should be a higher chlorophyll content. I'm not quite sure why that works um, but the science they, <laughs> they did it and that was the highest correlation and as you can see here it does seem a lot better. Um, these heat maps just show that metric uh, in action and you can see basically which one which specimen probably has more chlorophyll and which part of the specimen so this could potentially be used just for extracting uh, physically extracting a part of the specimen for further analysis so in conclusion uh, I think we've shown that it's basically possible to extract specific metadata uh, from images using just open source tools and do it automatically, <coughs> basically. Um, this could be used to identify species automatically um, or even just to cluster species so that you know uh, if what one of them is, anything else is similar to that, so that's probably the same species as well. <coughs> and in the future, it could be possible to generate uh, more descriptive metadata from this. So not just you know physical measurements or color, um, or at least something like saying this is this certain color. So maybe you could look for that color, or you could look for a certain pattern, or something like that, uh, rather than having to get too low level. Uh, this it was experimental and prototype, so not everything works perfectly, but it was a kind of first look into the into the area, and I think the results were fairly good. Um, all of this is available online, it can be used right now. Um, it's, not, uh, it's not an application, so you do need some programming knowledge to use it, but it's not, you don't also have to have computer vision expertise, um, which I think was part of the point of doing this, is to try and make it more accessible. So if you are a developer in, you know, in a different field, you might be able to use this as well. Uh, that's it, thank you for listening. Does anyone have any questions um, about James's work? Um, I had a question for Steve actually. So I was wondering how far would we have to um, reduce the error rate in measurements for it to be useful? So if we got it, um, so at the moment it's um, 0.2 of a millimeter in the wing lens. How far down would the error rate have to be before you think it would be um, good? Because we thought of some ways of improving it, but didn't implement them. Interesting to do the whole analysis of all of the specimens. Is it how many specimens did you do? Uh, 20. 20, yeah. yeah. So it was about 1,000 altogether when they come to About 800 odd, yeah. yeah. So probably we were doing some more, and then we could fairly error. <coughs> so, so I don't know. So then, so what would be worth doing would be to compare the analysis based on, on that with the 0.2 analysis based on the hand measured specimens and see if we get the same result. Yeah. Okay. A uh, question from Sandy at the back. Well, no, I just wanted to say is that when you when you have that error rate, surely it depends upon the size of the thing you're measuring. So an error of, of the size of error for something very small is going to be smaller than the size of the error. Um, so those errors are the comparison with the human measurements. So, um, so um, we didn't look at how the, the human had, had made the measurements, it was just comparing, um, because with the image, they're potentially skewed as well. Yeah. And we didn't um, uh, compensate for wing angles. Yeah. Although we did think, if you took a frontal shot of the butterfly, 
um, then you could use some simple trig to kind of make some corrections for that in theory. Yeah. Most of the images, there, were, there was only one that was kind of drastically different in its kind of pixels to millimetre ratio. Yeah. The rest of them were, were fairly consistent. So. Yeah. Do you know why that error was so big? Um, I think it was that it's the um, antenna was crossing over with the wing, so during the segmentation stage, it basically thought that was where the wing started. And I was just wondering about those areas. Are they are they are they all? It looks like they're all positives. Then. Uh, these, all it's just a, it's just absolute yeah. error. Yeah. yeah. So plus or minus. Yeah. 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 Um, but it did seem a lot of them. It was the the left wing that was possibly tilted, um, and you can see a lot of these red ones are higher. So, so maybe somebody who made the images, which is everybody here who made the images, how, how are the specimens aligned? Is it more likely that the, are they aligned against the left wing more than the right? It's probably, you know, the majority of people are right-handed and they put them in, they yeah. go in at such a slight angle, bias down the left angle or something like that. Yeah. It's just simple positioning, it gives that sort of skew. So possibly if we had a, a frontal shot as well, we could account for that angle. Yeah. Um, I, I, I have a um, question which I guess um, comes out of that, which is the orientation of the specimens. So when you yeah. apply the Gabor doctrine, um, I think then the, the, the orientation is, is inherently important. Yeah. So if there's an ever so slight, and, you, you know, and, and you're training with like 20 or so images, but if there's a slight skew on some of the specimens, yeah. you can see that there's like two or three angle difference. Does that then affect the Gabor doctrine at all? Um, yeah, it will affect it. Um, the the examples, uh, if I go back to that, so in the examples the angle did change as well, uh, but for the Gabor filters, they, they it's a fairly coarse um, difference between the orientations, so for this it shouldn't affect it too much, but yeah, I'm sure there is some effects of that. So um, these were eye collections images, um, so um, I think um, anyone in the audience can correct me, they were taken with a copy stand, but the distance between uh, the camera and the specimen will alter, um, because what if you just go back a couple of images to the, um, uh, the one with the labels in, yep. um, to, so the labels um, and the specimens uh, change in size, and, and the one that is, uh, one of the ones that was particularly of when we were looking at them had a very big label in, and so the specimen um, was comparatively much smaller than the labels. Um, and so th there are some, there is some variance in there. Uh, one more question. Um, uh, for this example, you used the school big machine on this, yep. and you said it's available from the library. Yep. Now, are, are there any others available? Because surely that would also influence your um, yeah. The results yeah, so that your absolute is sufficient. Yeah, so um so that so it's uh what we call classifier and yeah there are there are various different options that you can use for that. And yeah, so it's just another step. So um you should be able to replace that with something else. The same way that you could replace the Gabor filters with a different feature descriptor, <coughs> a different way of describing them. And, and you can mix and match those depending on what uh what you think is best for way to sort of run through all of them and choose the one with the best um, accuracy prediction? Mm. Um, there, there are applications out there okay. that can do a similar thing to that, yeah. Okay. Um, you do need some knowledge of how it's working okay. and but I think the, the kind of hardest bit is to find a way to put your data into them and that's what's a bit tricky at the moment um, and that was part of the idea with doing this is to go from an image to something, some kind of data that can be classified. Uh, so yeah, so that's the tricky thing. Though, like you say, that something to do that is is around at the moment, and open source as well. And one thing that would be kind of interesting. So these are all for human vision, but it would be quite interesting to do some comparisons um, using insect vision um, uh, simulations to see whether that changes the clustering, which I suspect it would. I know some work that have been done on bird, <coughs> um, bird photographs where using UV and 
pulling from the Batman the Unity Spectrum, you see a completely different set of characters, some of them really striking. So it might be interesting to start thinking about actually its relevance to our digital collections program and how we're photographing the specimens because of course because we're not seeing the characters that we would want to be able to extract we have to change that process. Mm -hmm. Well that's going to take through the tour of the exterior of the Indian chapters of Eastern Europe because we usually all got some bias in the European to us cryptic taxonomic characters. Thanks everyone uh, for coming. I hope you enjoyed that, and thanks again, James. I've been really impressed with your work. So, oh, yeah. cheers. Thanks.